are there elements of being from the South that have found their way into all of your music for movies and even on stage and so forth? You know, uh, yes. The short answer to that is yes. I um, uh, In Chattanooga, my mother was a uh, organist at the Southern Baptist Church there, so, uh, you know, I was singing from the time I could stand up. And as you know, uh, Southern Baptist Church music is uh, very beautiful and uh, emotional, and uh, so that became part of my musical influence along with uh, the rock bands I played in in high school. And then when I worked my way through college uh, at Middle Tennessee State University, I was doing... Uh, Session work and uh, and writing songs in Nashville uh, before I made my way out to California. So I had a a, a lot of musical influences uh, in Chattanooga. You know everything from from him to uh, to bar tunes. And then uh, when I got out to California, I was still playing rock and roll and still writing songs. And uh, R&B had also been a big part of uh, what I was doing in Chattanooga. I was in a band that was an R&B band. And I found myself writing a a lot of R&B tunes for Warner Brothers Music and being, you know, some of them being recorded by Michael Jackson and by uh, Joe Cocker and people like that. And um, when Cheech and Chong saw my band playing at a a club there, they asked me if I wanted to do uh, music for a, a movie they were doing. And um, I, of course, said yes, and that was that was 32 years ago. I want to ask you about this. I have to, you know. I know that a big formative experience for you happened at the, in 1969 at the Atlanta Pop Festival, which was, I think, really even more well-attended than Woodstock, maybe. I mean, it was huge. The was, guest list was huge, right? I mean, Jens Joplin and Greatest Clearwater and... And and Led Zeppelin, Dave Brubeck, Chicago. What was it about the one artist I know that you saw at that event that really inspired you to move to Los Angeles to pursue songwriting as a profession? Well, uh, I had just graduated from college and, you know, didn't exactly know what I wanted to do, so I decided to go to the Atlanta Pop Festival, which, as you said, you know, was uh, even bigger than Woodstock and, in fact, occurred before Woodstock, you know, just before it. Uh, and yeah. a lot of the same bands uh, who were at Woodstock actually played at the Atlanta Pop Festival first. So, you know, I was uh, a young, hippie kind of fella and went down there and <laughs> just really, really got into the experience of being at that festival. There was an amazing, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it, it was like Woodstock in that way, you know, this feeling of real community and belonging to this generation. I guess that I had partied a little too hardy, uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but all I remember is uh, as Joe Cocker was singing with a little help from my friends, I was clinging to the ground so I didn't get thrown off the earth by some people <laughs> before. <laughs> That's great. And, uh, and, and he was up was there with then, the Grease Band. He was up there with the Grease Band, had, right, with just Colonel Bruce Hampton's first band. You know, Colonel yeah. Bruce Nikki, is a friend of mine, you know, so. Is that right? Well, that's Nicky Hopkins and all those people, you know, we're playing yeah. with him. And, and and I tell you, I, that felt like I was gone. I had gone to church. So I <laughs> I, I took that as a, an epiphany, and uh, the next weekend I, I was on an airplane for Los Angeles. When you got to L.A., how long did it take you before you were writing songs that were being recorded and played and so forth, you know? Well, I, I, I formed a band with, an, with another Tennessean once I got there uh, named Wayne Barry, and we formed a band called Timber. And for the first two or three years I was there, that we recorded a couple of albums and, you know, played around uh, uh, up and down the West Coast and uh, had, had a pretty good run. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was during that, during that time that uh, one of the uh, fellows from Warner Brothers Music uh, heard some of my songs and asked me if I'd ever be interested in, uh, you know, doing some writing for other people. And so uh, once the band broke up, um, I decided it might be a, an interesting thing to do. So uh, they hired me as a staff writer, and for yeah, for about eight years, that's, you know, pretty much what I did. Yeah. Uh, now, I understand, you know, I have to ask you this. I understand your first and only hit, and I've listened to it online on, on YouTube, and it's great. And it was a hit in the UK with a song called Please Don't Run From Me. 
That's which right. Is still, it's still hailed as a classic of Northern Soul in, in Britain. But yeah. it has an unusual history, right? So can you tell us a little bit well, about the history there? Well, it, it, yes, uh, I can. Uh, they did not include a, a, a picture uh, with this record when they sent it over. And um, uh, the the uh, soul stations over there, you know, and the, the black dance clubs, uh, because it was my band was called the George Clinton Band, all figured that it was funkadelic, <laughs> you know. Of and course. So, uh, uh, yeah, and so they started playing this, and uh, people just really liked it, and so it was sort of a uh, a hit, but um, it's almost an accidental hit. You can still go on on YouTube and and listen to Please Don't Run for Me, and and there's still some some. Uh, some inclusions of it there that that picture George Clinton, you know George Clinton from yeah. Peace Song. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I, think I know. I think it's hilarious, and, and it's an easy mistake to make, and so forth. So, I know it is. It really is. <laughs> you know. So, so what are you going to say? You're 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 lumped in. Uh, uh, you're you're lumped in with with that person, you know, for for a long time uh, by virtue of your names. Now, that's true. Let me, that's let me, true. <laughs> Let me ask you this. So now we're going to get into the movies here. And I'm starting in 1980. And uh, I would be remiss if I did not ask you about working on one of my favorite cult movies, The Apple. Uh, the big, silly, <laughs> Golden Globus cult movie from 1980. Uh-huh. Can oh, yeah. you tell me? And, and I love this movie. I just adore it. Uh, it's just, it's just so. It, it's essential viewing, I think, for for anybody who is into cult movies, and and uh-huh. I really, I really dig it for uh, well, thanks, a lot of the reasons. You know, I, I dig it. I really do. Uh, I think it's amazing. What was your? Can you describe what your role in working on that film was? You know, I know you were the co-lyricist, uh, which is amazing too, and and you were the music supervisor and orchestrator. Do you have any yeah. specific memories of that? You know, incredibly oh, wild yeah. production. Very much so. The uh, the director was uh, an Israeli co- uh, director named uh, Menachem Golan, and he was sort of known for being kind of. Uh, a little bit uh, mashugana, as they say, <laughs> a little bit crazy. And yes. so he he had seen this stage musical uh, in Israel called Atapua, which was the apple. And uh, he had brought the fellow Kobe Recht and his wife Iris over to Hollywood to make a movie out of this musical. And they needed to find, they wanted to find somebody who could help Americanize the songs and and the music too, and mm-hmm. so a friend of mine worked for him uh, and suggested me, and I went over and I met with them, and we really hit it off. And so for the next year, I was working on this crazy musical about the future, and uh, wound up going to London um, and getting to conduct the uh, London Philharmonic Orchestra as for part of the score. I'm actually in the movie three different times. <laughs> As three different characters, really? Yeah, three, or... three different characters. You have to you have to look back, but you see me. I'm the I'm the hunch I'm the hunchback of Notre Dame in in the hell scene, uh, who hands hands the apple to uh, to the, the 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 lead actor. Oh, and I the, might have a picture I'm, of that on my website. You might very well That's have crazy. it. Anyway, <laughs> So it was it was quite an experience, and you know we we recorded the music in London and shot the movie in Berlin, and then uh, came back to Los Angeles, and it was a huge flop. <laughs> it's one of the great flops, and you and 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 and, uh, and I say that with the utmost uh, respect and and uh, affection for it. I, I just well, I just you. love it. Thank you. I, I well, just there, love it. There is actually. There's actually a club in Los Angeles called the Bad Movie Club, and mm-hmm. every now and then it shows it at midnight uh, because it's one of those bad movies that people really love. And so there, it's almost like the Rocky Horror Show. So the people who really know it show up and sing along with the music. And 
Oh, it really should true. be. It should be like on the on the level of Rocky Horror, I think. And you know, it just recently played at Walter Reed Cinema in in New York City when they were doing a Golden Globus uh, no retrospective. So you know, I mean, so there's nothing to be ashamed of there. It's amazing. Now, I now I want to move on to Cheech and Chong, who of all people okay. really helped guide you further into the film world. Uh, what was their your first meeting with them like, and how was that? How did that transition go from being, you know, being a rock artist and even a jazz artist to being a composer of movie music? Well, uh, uh, like I said, you know, I had a band, and uh, the as it turned out, this guy that was their film producer uh, lived across the street from this house that I was renting uh, the, the basement of. And uh, we had seen each other, you know, on the street and everything. And eventually he asked me what I did, and I told him. And uh, uh, I, you know, gave him one of my uh, records. And he said, hey, I want to bring somebody down to your gig. Uh, We were playing at a club there. And I said, great. And so as it turned out, it was uh, Cheech and Chong. And they um, came backstage and, you know, like they liked my music, and they came back uh, stage afterwards and said, "Hey, you know, you want to do some music, uh, music for our movie?" And I said, "Sure." And uh, I had never done film music before, uh, so um, but I figured it was Cheech and Chong. So it's, it's not <laughs> tough, you know, they, who, they may not might not have even noticed, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, as it turned out. Uh, I was able to take some uh, extension courses at UCLA in film scoring. I had a, I have a degree in music that I got at MTSU, so I already knew how to write for orchestra. And that's that's how I started uh, scoring movies. And it's funny, uh, the first one I did was called Still Smoking. And then that <laughs> next summer, next summer I get a call from from Chong. Hey Clinton, it's Chong. We're in uh, Paris, you know. Orion Pictures has rented us a chateau. We're doing this movie called. Uh, uh, Corsican Brothers, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just hanging. He said, well, come on over, man. You can do the music. So they sent me a plane ticket, and I spent the summer of 1983 or two in uh, outside Paris with Cheech and Chong <laughs> doing this crazy, crazy Corsican Brothers movie. I'm sure this is something that you could have not possibly expected in 1969. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to get deeper into your career. I've noticed that uh, with your scores to movies like uh, John, Naughton, John McNaughton's Wild Things and uh, 3,000 Miles to Graceland and uh, Del Shore's Sorted Lives, which is extremely a, a very extremely Southern movie, as well as many yeah. others that... Uh, your style is both both chameleon like, but yet it's only it only speaks to your roots as a rocker and as a jazz performer, even as a jazz performer. You know, what what are what kind of qualities do you think that your stage and recording experience has led, lent to your film music? You know, uh, I just you know, it's it's not there. There are not many people who have had your career tra- trajectory. Uh, you know, true, yeah. and you know. I think that um, there is a uh, – you're right, there is a rock and roll sensibility to to, to my approach, uh, even if it's an orchestra. Not that it's always loud and, and fast or, you yes. know, yes. but uh, there is a kind of a visceral or uh, uh, instinctive thing I try to, to get get into when I'm writing for a movie – so that I'm not, uh, it doesn't come from my head or from my intellect, but it comes from, you know, either my heart or my gut or whatever. And I think that's the way the rock and roll is, too. I think that, you know, it's not uh, uh, a cerebral music. And so I think that that's, that's what uh, is, is evident, uh, I, I hope, in my film music. And it's not necessarily a cerebral kind of uh, music that it's uh, somehow connected to the emotion of the film and you know the the visceral parts of the of the movie I, I definitely get that can I ask you uh, you know I, I you know 
I've I've often, you know, when I've, uh, you know, it took me a little while to, like, really recognize your scores, you know, immediately before I even saw your name on the screen. And then uh, and then sometimes, and then uh, there was a point where I said, is this a George S. Clinton score? And then it was, you know. But, uh, uh. and so, so I recognized, I recognized your work, you know, uh, immediately. Uh, but that's not to say that it's the same every time. You know, it, it changes right. all the time with with uh, you yeah. know orchestral scores and and even things like you know the boys next door. You know, which you did with yeah. uh, Penelope Spears. You know, that that was something very different. You know, so has a director ever given you a challenge that stumped you? Because I I just don't think you know my my personal opinion is that I don't think that you could be stumped. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It's, it, it, I tell you, it, it's been a challenge, and sometimes the first direction you go uh, is not the direction that the director wants uh, right away. And uh, a, a good director is willing to let you find. It's like the way they direct an actor. You know, they don't give them uh, word for word how they're supposed to to play their part. A good director lets that actor bring his own talent. Uh, to the role, and I think that it's the same thing when when they work with a composer. You have to let even if even if it's not right the first time, you have to give them enough direction and enough freedom to come back with something you know that that will be. And you know you wind up doing few, uh, individual pieces of music within a film sometimes three or four times uh, before you get it right, or before mm-hmm. you get it to the place the, the place where the where the director wants it. So the you know that's that's the challenge. Uh, the other thing that I try to do is to let the movie sort of tell me the kind of music that it needs. <laughs> you know, rather than right. superimposing a concept on it uh, right off right off the bat, I really try to live with the movie and talk to, with the director and uh, and then you know start hearing things that I think uh, th- that'll fit. Right. I mean, I, I noticed that, you know, with uh, the things like the Red Shoe Diaries uh, series yeah. and, of course, with the Mortal Kombat series, you know, which I think are both pretty popular. With the latter, you know, with Mortal Kombat, it's fascinating that you took elements of Asian music and heavy metal uh-huh. and then orchestral music and fused them together. How much inspiration was taken from the original video game and for that? For that project, what is for it? the Mortal Kombat is project. It? Interesting story uh, about that. Um, when they hired me to do the score originally, they thought it was just going to be a straight up orchestral action score. Uh, and so they have these things called the test market screenings, where they'll invite an audience to come and see um, uh, an unfinished version of the film. You know, it's been edited together, but none of the final visual effects are in and none of the real uh, music is in. So they'll put what they call temporary music or a temp score under the film to show it to an audience to kind of get a feeling for whether or not, you know, the, the film is working. So anyway, they, they, sh- they uh, the, the place that they, they did this test marketing in L.A. was in a very kind of rough part of town. And I knew it was going to be a very special screening because I was sitting on the aisle and I heard this usher come up and whisper to the manager, there's a guy in the first row and he's got a gun. <laughs> and so the, the manager said to the, the usher, don't piss him off. <laughs> so I thought, all right, this is, this is going to be a good screening. So anyway, what happened was they, they always uh, ask people to fill out these uh, questionnaires at the end. And everybody hated the musical approach because all these kids had gotten used to that song, you know, from the Mortal Kombat game. Mortal Kombat, right? You know, that thing. It wasn't and, bad. And, bad. No, and huh. to the techno music. And, you know, that's what that's what they were used to when they played the game. Mm-hmm. So the next morning we had a big summit. And uh, that night I sat down and came up with this concept called Techno Taiko Orco. And what that means is the techno is, of course, using the techno music as sort of the core of, you know, of the score. And then the taiko part of it, uh, these big old Japanese drums called taiko drums, and using Asian drums and Asian flutes, you know, and those ethnic instruments. Uh, And then the last element, the orco, is like orchestra, 
And mm-hmm. so uh, it wasn't just any kind of orchestra. I called it my testosterone orchestra because I didn't want any treble clef instruments. In other words, no violins, no flutes, nothing that was high uh-huh. fit. Right. Just all this low beefy. Uh, uh, like low beefy beef thing. Sound. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So that was sort of the, the concept, and the, the film company uh, loved it. And um, that's how that, that sound came about. <laughs> that's very distinctive. Now I have to move on to the Austin Powers movies, you know, which are great because they so well approximate that John Barry and Monty Norman scoring style from the Bond movies. Yeah. But there's there's just something just a little bit off, you know, in those in those movies. You know, is there a specific yeah. dynamic working there in writing music for comedy uh, and you know, I, I mean, you know, you obviously have a good sense of humor. I'm, I imagine, you know, that comes to the fore in a lot of ways. Well, that's true. And, uh, you know, that's one of the, I think, important things about being able to write for comedy is to understand humor. But working with Mike Myers, he's a, he's really a comic genius. And I, I learned so much about writing for comedy just from working with him because, um most of the time in those movies, the the music is like the straight man, you know, in a comedy. In a comedy uh, do, right. You know, yeah, you, I know that. The we're watching them, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so the music kind of plays it straight so that Dr. Evil is even funnier and so that Austin Powers is even funnier because they don't realize how ridiculous they are. And so but it's I not think, entirely I, straight, you know. It's not entirely no, straight. No, There's just exactly. like a couple of things off in it. You know? That's right. There's all there's always a wink in it somewhere. But, yeah. Uh, but I, what I tried to do is uh, put myself inside Doctor Evil's head and say to myself, okay, what kind of music would Doctor Evil like to hear at this point <laughs> in the film? You know. Right. <laughs> And what kind of music would Austin Powers like to hear while he's being, you know, Austin Powers? And so mm-hmm. I tried to let that kind of influence uh, what I was writing. And then the uh, the whole idea of, of comic timing is so important. You know, it's it's like where you stop the music before the funny thing happens. You know, there's a... Uh, uh, he he would run into something, and I would I would play the music up to the point and stop just before he ran into it, so there would be this little pause prior yeah, uh, to the sound of, prior to the sound of him of him hitting that whatever he ran into, and it made it funnier. Yeah, yeah, it really it really uh, you know it's it's one of those things you, that you don't realize is happening as a viewer or whatever, right. and you really That's have to true. you know. You really have to go back and really like uh you know, dissect it, you know. One of the things I'm interested in 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 the Austin Powers movie is the collaboration and in all your movies between the composer and the music supervisor since sort source music is so integral to movies nowadays yeah. and in those movies too. I'm specifically yeah. thinking about the uh the present day tracks used like Madonna's Beautiful Stranger and along with yeah. adapted tracks like the Quincy Jones Soul Bossa Nova and Tommy James' right. Dragging the Line and so many. Can you take us through the dyma- dynamics of that collaboration? Well the uh, in terms of uh, the songs that were uh, the the Soul Bossa Nova came about because uh, it was recorded in 1962 by Quincy Jones, and it was a theme song to a television show in Canada, some game show, uh, where Mike Myers grew up. And so he sort of knew, he had that melody in the back of his head, you know, for all that time. And when he started coming up with his Austin Powers character, that was a piece of music he used to play over and over again for himself, you know, to get into the character. So by the time they hired me to score the film, that was already in place as a piece of music that they wanted to use. So my job at that point became to take Quincy's original recording and to make uh, to reproduce it, you know, re-record it and make it work in a cinematic way for the for the whole film. And uh, that was great. Uh, I didn't really get to collaborate with Quincy on there other than you know by telephone and. Uh, 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 I met him uh, at one point when we both were on the set for the, the uh, Gold Member, the last Austin Powers movie. 
but uh, uh, that's sort of the way I worked in collaboration with him on that. But uh, the songs that you mentioned, uh, I really had no input on uh, at all. Those were decisions made by the director and by Mike Myers and uh, the music supervisor. Uh, right. They, you know, went after the the songs of the period that they thought would really work great. What I did have to make sure of, though, is that if I had a piece of music that was coming into the song or going out of the song, that it was either uh, in the same key as the song, so it would sound, you know, like uh, like it was of the same piece of music or of the same tempo. Sometimes I had to try to recreate um, the sound of that record for a period of time so that it wouldn't end so abruptly, you know, how records uh, end differently than you want them to in the movies. Exactly, yeah. So you kind of have to be in sort of like a little bit of a DJ there, too. So that's, that's yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, you know, let me ask you, you know, uh, there's so many movies I want to ask you about. John Waters or Dirty Shame, which is a great score, and then and so unusual, and then Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and so forth, um, yeah. which was which was you know, incredibly different for you, but not so incredibly that you couldn't recognize, you know, what you were doing there and that, that it was you. You know, uh, I, want, I want to ask you, you know, what is the what is the role of film music in creating, you know, just tell me, you know, what is the role of film music in creating the emotional landscape of a film? And is there a line that can be crossed when the music is giving you too much information about how you, how a viewer should be feeling at any certain moment? Yeah, well, to answer your second question first, yes, there is a line that, that can be crossed where you suddenly become aware as an as a audience member that you're being manipulated, you know? And that that's when when the audience becomes aware of the music manipulate them man, manipulating them that's the point you've gone too far because you don't want the audience to even notice what the music is doing to them you know it's it's a, almost supposed to be subliminal and uh, so to answer your your first part of the question yeah definitely one of the one of the main jobs of film music is to underscore the emotions within a scene yeah, and within the movie. In fact, that's where the word scoring comes from. You mm -hmm. know, to underscore something in writing is to draw a line under it, and that means you're yeah. emphasizing whatever that word is. I never is. thought about that, yeah. Yeah, that's where scoring comes from. To underscore a scene uh, means that you're you're drawing this emotional line under the scene to emphasize the emotions that, that are within that scene. And so, um, yeah, that's the emotional landscape of, of the film and a really good, I think, composer-director combination. Find ways of doing that that are so um, natural that the audience is just unaware. All they know, know is that they're feeling a certain way at that moment in the film. And, you, you know, they really can't pinpoint exactly why they're feeling that way. Mm. The way we always like to uh, conclude uh, our interviews with each of the composers is to ask, ask each composer if you had to pick three film scores, you know, other than your own. And I'd be curious to know also what are your own favorite of your own scores, too, because you've done so many. So I, you know, I'd be I'd prefer to hear you know two parts to this question answer this two part answer here, but if you had three film scores other than your own to recommend as essential listening to movie fans, what would they be? Uh, most recently, it would be Michael Dana's amazing score to Life of Pi, mm. the new movie that just came out. It's just, He's probably going to win amazing. the Oscar for that, you know. <laughs> I hope he does. I hope he does. He's 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 the real deal, and uh, that that's one of my favorite, most favorite recent scores uh, of all mm. time. Um, in terms of older scores, um, I love the the score to uh, Citizen Kane. You know, which right. is um, an amazing Bernard score. Herman. Yeah, exactly, and uh, almost anything of his, really. 
Yeah. But then, in, you know, then in the middle you have people like Jerry Goldsmith with Basic Instinct, and, and then you also have, and all you know his great Chinatown stuff. But also you have people like Henry Mancini. Charade is just one of these amazing, you know. Uh, it's really hard to make uh, to, to choose out of all the scores that there are. Uh, but I know I there's those. so many different kinds. I mean, we're we're just the K's for the sh- for Shaft and and uh, oh, I then, know. You know. Well, well exactly. <laughs> Man, you know. you know that is so true. That I listened to that score so much when I was doing uh, uh, Austin Powers, especially the last Austin Powers. Oh, but uh, but anyway, yeah, those I think are some of my favorites. You know, of other people, and then of mine, I would say that uh, uh, most recently would probably be um, I don't know, but. Bury My Heart and Wounded Knee is one of my favorites of mine because it was uh, a subject that I really felt emotionally connected to. And um, HBO allowed me to use a, a Native American flute player named John Tuhawk from the score. And mm-hmm. he brought a real uh, sense of, uh, you know, authenticity and, and spiritual beauty to it that uh, that's stunning. And then, uh, strangely enough, uh, the John Waters Dirty Shame score... <laughs> It's one of my, one that of my score favorite is experience. crazy. This <laughs> score is know. crazy. It's got it's so totally many crazy. elements going on in it. It's, it's I nutty. I, I, <laughs> I, I told John, I said, I want it to be rockabilly meets uh, uh, Catholic uh, liturgical music meets uh, uh, Ema Sumac. And he said, mm-hmm. go for it. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> I'm so, sure that appealed you know, to him. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, um, I don't know. Um, I I really liked uh, the the score to um, all the Austin Powers stuff, but I think my favorite one of those three scores is probably the last one because uh, uh, everybody everybody had the budget they needed by then. I got to use a choir, and Mike Myers got sharks with laser beams attached to their foreheads. So, well, I know you. I know you said uh, that you hope that uh, you hope that. Uh, you know, when you're at the end of your career, that your last score will be your your favorite of everything that you've done, and uh, and well, I hope that uh, your career is uh, is shooting right on forth, right on. Uh, well, thank you. You know, and as a matter of fact, I'm uh, speaking to you now from uh, Boston, uh, where I've taken over as the chair of the film scoring department at Berkeley College of Music. And uh, we've I've kept my house and studio in L.A., and I'm going to be going back and forth to do projects, you know. But uh, uh, over the last 10 or 12 years at the Sundance Composers Lab, I've been working a lot with young composers. And um, when they notified me uh, from here that this was a position that was opening up, um, I really saw it as a great opportunity. So uh, I just survived my first blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, think, California, uh, I, I tell you. 